Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Stash Report from the Stash Project. Today is September 16th, 2019. Just a little one for you today. Just a few kit releases, both domestically and overseas. No real news or anything else like that this week. Uh, one point we did want to cover, though. I've now gotten confirmation from uh, at least two people that they have gone out and purchased themselves a Salvino JR uh, Richard Petty Buick Regal kit. I don't know if it was necessarily to see if the decals existed or if they really wanted to get one to get the decals for the Oldsmobile that doesn't have the tire decals, but lo and behold, lordy lordy, those decals don't exist in that kit. I didn't want to come on as soon as the first one, Brett, came up and, and said, hey, look, I, there's no, I don't see any extra decals in this kit. And I just wanted to make sure, get a couple other people, Scott has now confirmed, and a few other people, that, uh, yes, there are no extra Goodyear Eagle tire decals in the, in the Buick Regal Richard Petty kit that just came out a few weeks ago to replace the decals that don't exist in the Oldsmobile kit that Salvino refuses to actually send to you individually because apparently that would be too much actual work and effort. But apparently, putting them into the kit that they promised they would be in, also too much work and effort. So, yeah, I, 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 I would post something on their Facebook page but about that, but that would just get deleted, probably get me banned. I'd be too negative for them. So, uh, yeah, I, I I really don't understand what the game plan is here. Maybe this is like Star Wars and this is not the petty kit you were looking for in terms of getting some decals. That would require them to issue another Richard Petty kit here pretty quickly, or otherwise this starts looking like a fiasco instead of something that was at best questionable business practices in the sense of replacement parts. Hey, we want the replacement parts? Go buy this other kit. They'll be in there. Wow, that sounds familiar. That sounds like the when we put out the Monte Carlo, it's going to have a spare suspension set in it to fix your Oldsmobile. And then you end up having to go buy the Oldsmobile parts separately for six bucks a runner for the new bumpers and the grill and the new suspension. Gee, I wonder how long it'll be before you have to kick them like $5 to get your set of decals. Because it certainly didn't come in the Regal. I don't know. We were just discussing this last night on our Facebook page for this channel. And uh, the conclusion that we're coming to is that, you know, they're going to pretty much run themselves out of business sideways because the couple of bucks they're saving here and there on a few things and then making you pay for those couple of bucks down the road to get the things you should have gotten in the first place um that's gonna get a reputation within the modeling community behind their ability to control it on their facebook page and social media outlets and uh, you're gonna start seeing their sales go down and then you're gonna start seeing the dealers taking putting in smaller orders and this is how, uh, you know, failures happen. And I'm not wishing them any kind of failures. I think it's great to have that other uh, competition, if you will, in the, in the domestic U.S. modeling manufacturing. But I don't see how this helps them long term. Short term, not putting the decals in the kit and then not refusing to send them out as a replacement part might have saved them postage and printing, although the printing should have been charged with inputting them into the next kit that came out that doesn't exist in, but it certainly saved them probably several hundred dollars worth of postage. But now, are you really, do you really, really want to buy a Salvino's JR kit at this point? Because what's going to be wrong with it when you get it, and then what are you going to have to do to get it fixed? Uh, we've seen now that with the Regal, the Tires are new, and then so is all of the glass. For some reason, the glass uh, runner, glass molds were not included or were too damaged to be used or whatever because you know, there's never really been an actual explanation as to why they had to tool up new stuff. But the windshield doesn't fit. Um, it's not like terribly doesn't fit like the Mobius Pontiac kit was when the first one that came out or some of the early versions of the F-Series pickup trucks. But there definitely is a noticeable gap around the top edge, especially in the cor upper corners of the windshield, where the glass does not fit the kit. And if you do not believe me, and it may not be a big deal, but if you do not believe me, go over to HPI Guy 
web uh, you know channel where he does all of the kit reviews and and I will put out there that that Chris and I at least within the context of forum interactions are by by, by means not exactly friends with each other uh, you know I'm sending you to somebody who you know is 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 not like a buddy pal who's just gonna back up my position on this uh, you know he had to basically put in a very goopy clear glue to sort of backfill in the space. He does make this salient point that did the original glass not fit as well? I don't know, because when I came into NASCAR building as a kid, we would have been in the late 80s, early 90s, and so, you know, the Buicks that I built were like the Hutch Strickland car and uh, Bobby Allison's car, the Rebustos Buick, the Snickers Buick, along with the, I guess there's supposed to be Delta 88, Oldsmobiles, the, there was a Kmart wins one, and there was also um, uh, Kelly Arborough's Hardy's car. Those are like the Buick and the Oldsmobiles that like click with me and my the, the kits I'd like to see released because the early '80 cars are a little bit before my time. In 1982, I would have been like uh, five, and NASCAR, you know, wasn't hadn't taken hold yet. It's somewhere in the you know somewhere in that mid '80s range, right when I started building models in general. Uh, that I started probably because I was building models following NASCAR. Hey, I've got these race car kits. What are they? What are they about? Oh, and my grandmother, ironically, is the one that really was into NASCAR in my family. But be that as it may, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't remember actually ever building one of the early 1980 Buick uh, kits or any of the 19, the early 80s kit. I might have built an early Thunderbird, but I don't remember. Building an early '80s Buick, and I don't remember building the early '80s Pontiac Grand Prix kits. Those were just a skosh before my time, so I can't, you know, say with well, a wall. I remember that the windshield does or didn't or whatever, but it's just more of the calamity of errors that is befalling them trying to plow stuff out without really paying attention to quality control. And another thing that's on our Facebook group is a picture of a one of the sprues, uh, the chrome plated sprues out on the Monte Carlos that Scott got, and it's. I mean, the parts look like they're okay. Won't really technically know until you put them on the kit because some, something like a bumper could be, you know, twisted just out of square and not fit anymore the right way. But his entire sprue looks like a, a bunch of chrome-plated spaghetti. It's warped all over the place. More, more than likely, uh, you know, came out of the mold. Too, you know, didn't have enough. The cycle was running too fast on the mold. It was ejecting the, the plastic without it being cooled. And then nobody noticed that or didn't care. And then they proceeded to send it to the chrome plater who, you know, some people, well, it shouldn't have came out of the chrome plater. That's not really the chrome plater's job to decide whether or not they want to chrome plate something. You send it to them, they're going to chrome plate it, no matter what it looks like. So, um, you know, it would have been very easy at the time of, of production to just, you know, throw that into the, sh into the chipper with all the other reject things. And people just realize that, you're, you know, if you're doing a run of a model kit, not every single sprue comes out r the right way. There's all sorts of temperature variations and stuff like that within the molding process. And you get a bin of parts that are short shot or just don't look right or they're warped or, or whatever. And you just basically you shred them down back into pellets and you run them back through them, you know, melt them down and run them back through again. Um, and that is something that clearly <laughs> should have been done at least to the sprue the Scott got just from an appearance thing. It just looks like they're in a hurry and they don't care because that shouldn't that's just something that shouldn't be sent out to the end product is it damaged probably not uh so you know it's not something to throw a, a tirade about but it's just another example so anyway on to the actual kit releases this week like i said we do have some domestic things they are uh, round two kits and uh they are first up this it is the reissue of the 1965 uh, Chevrolet Chevelle station wagon. This is now the surf wagon. Oh, yeah, because, you know, you're going to go out to surf and this floral dress this lady has on. And, and apparently this, like, long sleeve shirt that this guy has on. I, I, I'm sure it's supposed to be a jacket, but be that as it may. Uh, newly tooled, uh, the surfboards are back. They were in the original kit. They've been retooled, and then they put an actual roof rack into this that is actually... You know, for the surfboards to mount, surf bars, surfboards to mount to the bars. Uh, the original kit had some sort of weird roof thing that, they, that the surfboard just sort of sat on. It was not an actual rack. <laughs> it did not actually hold them. They just, it was just a 
a, a, a product of the 1960s, let's put it that way. And otherwise, this kit is the same 1965 Chevelle wagon that has been reissued a, a bunch of times. It was reissued, uh, what, back in, like, 2012, 2013, is the Super Wagon. This does have all the parts, the drag stuff, the ramps, uh, the custom parts, the stock parts. So everything is in there, just, uh, you know, some new parts added to it. And then we have this, which is also from AMT. It is their reach of the, their 1969 Yenko Chevy Camaro. Uh, there is, for all intents and purposes, absolutely no reason in the world you should actually purchase this model kit. I don't say that about a lot of things, but this is just one of those scenarios where this kit is wildly mediocre at best in terms of proportions, in terms of everything about it. And the Ravel 69 Camaro is such an excellent kit that there is almost no reason for this kit to exist at this point. I mean, I understand Round 2 owns this stuff and run it off. It's a, sort of akin to printing money because there's, you know, very little cost involved here other than designing a new box and putting in new decals. The plastic is the same as it's always been, and it's always been a mess. But if you want a Yenko Camaro, go, to, go back to your hobby shop. They probably still have a couple laying around because of how many... Uh, of 69 Camericus exist at this point in the wild. They they did a Yanko Camaro just of what two years ago maybe tops as the as the Fast and the Furious tie-in. It came out before the or before or right after the uh, Dom's Charger version of the 70 Charger tooling was was issued. I see no redeeming value in this whatsoever. But I mean eh, it's up to you. And lastly, on the MPC side of things, we got a reissue of their Snap Tight uh, 1969 Dodge Charger. This with the Coca Cola tie in. Uh, the glass in here, there is a clear glass, but their shtick in this is that there is a green Coke bottle, green tinted glass that comes with this as well. Uh, I've seen a lot of people on Round Two's actual uh, Facebook page, as well as their YouTube uh, videos that they put out every month. Um, that were like, why are they reissuing this crap? They should put out a Palookaville from 1956. People would buy it, sell like hotcakes. Gotta make what the people want, blah, blah, blah. Well, you have to understand within the business side of this, aside from the fact that they clearly have paid for a Coca-Cola, uh, uh, you know, license, this 1969 Dodge Charger kit was a brand new tool about, what, three years ago now? And it was a new tool, Dukes of Hazard. Um, it sort of being a new tool, it didn't have some of the problems that the MPC 1969 glue kit Dodge Charger has, uh, and the all was right with the world. And then that shithead, pardon my French, shot up that church in Charleston, and then the Dukes of Hazard was not a thing anymore, and it got pulled off TV because apparently, you know, if you're a totally useless racist asshole, uh, you kill off a TV show that, right, frankly, let's face it, wasn't all that particularly fantastic in the world. There's a lot of people attached to that TV show in a creepily, creepily invested way, but I don't think it really put forward just because there was the Confederate uh, naval jack on the roof, a, some sort of subliminally racist message, necessarily. So that's just me. Overreaction to everything is what we do in this country at this point. But because there is no more Dukes of Hazard, because not because Round Two is holding some sort of moral high ground, it's because Warner Brothers won't license anything from the show anymore. They had this brand new tool, 1969 Dodge Charger, and nothing to do with it anymore because, whoops, they couldn't release it as the Dukes of Hazard. So then they threw in the torque thrust wheels and they released it as like a civilian car. And we're gonna. This is like the next step in trying to pay for that tooling that accidentally couldn't pay for itself because of something that really was out of Round Two's control because it wasn't their fault that that happened. So it's back out. Now, you know, Coca-Cola people will like this, I think, because, I mean, it's certainly got an interesting graphics package on it, if nothing else. And they, you know, it's got a Coca-Cola bottling garage. Uh, I'm assuming this is supposed to be a Coca-Cola facility, and, and which, you know, might have had a garage for its trucks at the time, but I, I don't think it necessarily was fixing 69 Dodge Chargers. Uh, but at any rate, the, the whole you know, point here is Coca-Cola collectors will probably collect this because it's a little bit unique. It's not something that has been sort of done a gajillion times like some of the other AMT Coca-Cola kits, because some of the Coca-Cola kits that AMT has reissued are reissues of the last time they had a Coca-Cola livery back in the AMT Urdle days. So, 
I, I will cut them the slack of releasing that again after they just released it not too long ago as a City Slicker kit, just because, again, they're, they're trying to get some cash back from creating that model, and, you know, I don't think you can necessarily make an insurance claim based on racists that ruined my model kit, uh, ability for my model kit to be released. So, anyway, that's the domestic side of things. We've got three, uh, say, excuse me, four kits. Over on the uh, Japanese side of things, we got uh, three Hasegawas and an Aoshima. Aoshima spot run of the Sea West tuner version of their R34 Nissan Skyline GTR. Um, you know, we've covered their, their GTR a number of times, not as good as the Tamiya one, but Tamiya didn't really do any tuner versions of it, because Z-Tune, to me, is not a tuner version of the R34, because that was a factory-supported uh, Nismo project, where they bought back used cars and, and converted them to Z-Tunes. That's, that's not Sea West, that's not mines or anything else. So, uh, that's back out, just to slay this, just a straight restock reissue. And then over at Hasegawa, they have a one re straight restock reissue, and that is this, the 1970 East African Safari Rally winner, the Nissan Bluebird 1600 SSS. Uh, very famous car in rallying because, um, yeah, who would have thought of, of some, like, a four-door economy car from Japan could come over into what is, you know, nominally, at the time, one of the, you know, most more most difficult rallies in the world and win it um then they showed him up and again the next year with the z car that did that won the rally but that's back out it's a cool kit just in general and then uh, we got a couple of 124 scale uh open wheel cars first up we have this which is the honda f1 ra 272e 1965 italian grand prix this is a reissue now i think the third reissue of the the honda ra uh there's nothing specifically special about this kit in terms of how the car placed. It just has a slightly different livery involved than the other two kits have had at this point. And then last one for this video is this. It is the, uh, I'm going to assume this is Kaignus Tonin or Kaignus Toninen. <laughs> I'm assuming that looking at this, it would be Tonin and I don't know how you're going to, if that's, is there a, a silent vowel there? Is it like, Ignis and the KSI, I don't know. I really honestly couldn't tell you. But be that as it may, it's a Lola T9050 Formula 3000 car. So this is Japan, the All Japan Formula 3000 series. There was a global one and a Japanese only one. This is, of course, a Japanese only one. Uh, you can you get two liveries in this uh, with this. This uh, box art presentation is the 1990 uh, season livery. They also include the 1991 season livery inside. Car was moderately successful. Uh, had some podiums here and there. Um, I think it, the uh, there's two or two drivers for this uh, vehicle, if I remember right. I'm going to go ahead and while I'm sitting here talking, look it up because I can't remember. But I believe it was two two different drivers. One was brand new to open wheel. Uh, did had some moderate success for being a brand new driver. And then I think they had a season driver in the other car, because I believe in addition to having two years worth of liveries, I believe there's two different drivers each year. Uh, or Well, two drivers, not two different ones. Same drivers both years. But you know what I'm trying to say. They're team cars. And let me look up the thing here. And uh, It has uh, uh, Hitoshi Ogawa, who is the 1989 series champion, and then Masahiko Kayama, who was the form F3 champion in 1989, who stepped up to Formula 3000, and uh, looks like Ogawa's uh, earned 34 points throughout the series, and uh, the younger driver picked up a single point. And I think if Formula 3000 scores the same way F1 does, I think you have to be in the top 10 to get points. So uh, I'm not exactly sure. It, it, the The records of this uh, are as the records of the race are kind of hard to get in terms of overall placement. Like there's usually a season recap that'll tell you who won what races. But if you didn't win the race, then you know, whoops, <laughs> we don't tell you about the first, second, third place thing. But like I said there's two two seasons worth of uh, liveries in there, 90, 91, and then the driver, two team cars, the two drivers for both those years. So at any rate, guys, I believe that wraps up this one. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, well, I know for a lot of us, we're getting a, an Indian summer as they would call it. We're getting a second dose of summer here in the end of September. Um, 
We've actually got up in here, uh, up close to the 90s here <laughs> recently, but it looks like fall is uh, trying to force its way back in, and I'm you know, perfectly fine with that because then I can stop dehydrating my basement and all of the other fun stuff that comes with summer, just the humidity that is Pennsylvania. Even if it's not, like overtly humid the way it would be in say like louisiana it's still humid when it's hot here this is not a dry heat here by any stretch of the of the imagination and so you know despite all the best efforts i still have to run a dehumidifier in the basement to try to keep the humidity level to something uh non-model kit eating levels um and then once the fall comes well it cools off and the humidity goes away and i don't really i may have to run the thing every now and then just to sort of dry the, the place out but it's not a constant everyday battle like it is in the summertime so anyway i am looking forward to fall that is the overall main overarching uh, gist of this whole point so anyway i'm gonna wrap it up here and uh see you guys on the other side